All I thought about were the people that I was going to probably never see again. So the relationships that mattered most, girlfriend, mum, dad, sister, you know, best friends, Matt, who's there. And as I'm falling, you know, what I don't know is happening is Matt has seen what's happened and he has a decision to make. Does he do nothing, which guarantees his own safety? Or does he try to save his best friend's life, which inherently means risking his own? So I grew up as a, I don't know, typical inner city boy, wanted to play for his local football club, West Ham. And yeah, we lived in East London until I was about 11 before we moved to, to the countryside. It was surreal and maybe a little bit alien to be surrounded by hills and not by kind of heavy, you know, urban areas. And also the kind of demographic swap, whereas in London it's a real melting pot of nationalities, ethnicities. Shropshire's really not like that, so that was like an adjustment in its own way. But living in Shropshire opened up kind of a whole new world to me, which was one of adventure, you know, the outdoors and friendships that would be formed by doing those things. What were you like as a child? I think I was a very energetic, not overly academic, very middle of the road child, never really excelled at anything, um, but always tried very hard. And I think that st stood me in good stead for later in life, where I guess the qualities of determination, perseverance and resilience are really important. But at that age, you don't know that. At that age, you think it is all about natural talent. You think it is all about natural ability. And when did you get your first taste for adventure? I met Matt when we were at school, when I moved up to Shropshire. Um, and he kind of said to me one day, have you heard of Bear Grylls? And I was like, no. And he was like, come round to mine. I've got a DVD. We need to watch it. So I go around to his house. Um, meet everybody for the first time, meet his family for the first time. He puts on this Bear Grylls episode, which is Bear Grylls in Scotland. And he's like jumping off, you know, rocks into water. He's building like a makeshift camp, climbing a mountain. And Matt just looked at me and went, we should do this. So the first time I'd ever climbed a mountain was Snowden in winter, covered in snow, didn't have any of the gear I needed, got to the summit, and it was just a complete horizon shift in life where you realise that you're far more capable than the person that's quite hard on yourself in the classroom because you're never excelling that evening, kind of making a makeshift camp, poured down, absolutely soaked, piss wet through, but loved it. And it was this weird, I don't know, weird passion was born for being uncomfortable, but in beautiful places. All from a D DVD of Bear Grylls. So thank you, Bear, I guess. Before we knew it, we were developing as climbers, developing as mountaineers, you know, going around the world to, to climb into, you know, do things as a pair, and adventure was the cornerstone of our friendship. Our lives were very different. You know, Matt was down in Portsmouth with the Royal Navy. I was up in Shropshire, you know, in the Army Reserve, um, just about to start my career as a teacher. And it was the mountains and it was adventure that brought us back together with some of these climbs that we were doing, maybe in, in Europe or in the Alps, or even at home, do have elements of risk that you can't control because you are in a situation where you're a very small thing on a very big natural space that doesn't really care about you. You know, an avalanche doesn't care that you're in its way. Um, a crevasse certainly doesn't care if you fall into it or you don't fall into it. We had a moment on Monte Rosa, second highest mountain in Europe, where a kind of storm rolled in quite unexpectedly. We're somewhat cut off just a few hundred meters below the summit. Um, and we're surrounded by crevasses and we had to navigate our way back through those slow, slowly with pretty much no visibility, no kind of sense of where we needed to get to based on just visual. We were, you know, a support for each other in those moments where perhaps the bravery and the courage was wavering a little bit. But that's, yeah, that's friendship for you. So on a weekend much like any other, I sort of called Matt and I said like, shall we, you know, shall we go to the mountains? So. You know, we live 45 minutes from a, a series of cliffs inside North Wales, and the very final section of this cliff is called World's End. And World's End is a 200-foot sort of vertical limestone rock face. And on this day, 6th of August, really lovely sunny day, I kind of said to Matt, look, I'll, I'll lead today and uh, let's climb up and down a few times. And we start to climb, you know, a different route to World's End, and we vary kind of the difficulty of it. And we're there for maybe two and a half, three hours and there's one final section to go. So we're three quarters of the way up World's End. 
So we've got this sort of, you know, 150 foot drop below us and we've got this final section to the very top. And, you know, I, I kind of walked away from Matt and walked perhaps six foot to his side. And I sort of started looking up at this crack that ran vertically up the rock face and set off. And it was at the limit of my kind of climbing ability, which was modest, and I'll admit that. And, you know, it was a struggle to do it, but I got to the top. There's something magical about standing on top of that cliff face and looking down over your shoulder and you see the drop, you see the sense of accomplishment quite visually. Um, but it was as I got to the top, and what you do as that lead climber is you indicate to your partner below that you're safe, you're stood on firm ground. So I looked down over my left shoulder. Matt's looking up at me from this sort of six foot wide ledge um, below me. And I give him the thumbs up, I say I'm safe, and I unclip myself from the rope. So I've unclipped from all of the protection that I've just put into the rock face that if I was to fall whilst clipped in, would hold. And as soon as you unclip, you're, you're unprotected. And I kind of go about setting up a belay point so I can protect Matt as he comes up to me. But it's as I'm doing that, and as I move back towards the edge of that cliff, F, that cliff edge, and I kind of look down over my left shoulder to shout something down to Matt. As I stood there, as I transferred my weight to my left leg, the section of rock that I was stood on, which was perhaps four foot wide and about two foot deep, um, collapsed beneath my feet. Sort of split second later, I felt uh, scared, fearful, vulnerable. And as that rock collapsed beneath my feet, it took me with it. And I was probably falling for three to four seconds, but in my kind of mind and in my world that lasted a hell of a lot longer and uh, I'll quite happily admit that I was scared I was going to die and, and I genuinely thought what are the chances of surviving I know there's a 200 foot drop that leads down to a, a scree slope beneath me all I thought about were the people that I was going to probably never see again so the relationships that mattered most girlfriend mum dad sister you know best friends Matt who's there and as I'm falling, you know, what I don't know is happening is Matt has seen what's happened and he has a decision to make. Does he do nothing, which guarantees his own safety, or does he try to save his best friend's life, which inherently means risking his own? So I'm falling through the air. Um, I land flat on my back on that six foot wide ledge. And as I land, I, I break my back and I sever my spinal cord. So I'm sort of rendered paralyzed from the chest down and I'm continuing to tumble and that six foot wide ledge um, I was quickly approaching the edge of that where I would fall the rest of the way. And Matt has already thought about what he was going to do. He's made his decision. And as I've landed, he's sprinted towards me. And without really considering his own safety, he's thrown his body on top of mine, which was timed and had enough force behind it that it kind of dragged me to a halt as we were about to slip off that ledge. So in that moment, you know, my best friend saved my life. And obviously one of the first things you try to do, and certainly the first thing I tried to do was to stand up. And I'm lying on my back, you know, Matt's kind of got off the top of me and I tried to stand up to laugh it off. Um, I'm not in pain at this point. And as I try to stand up, nothing below my chest's move. And I realize for the first time that I can't feel my legs. I realize that I can't move them. And we put it down to shock and I lie there for about 10 minutes whilst Matt's on the phone to Mountain Rescue, whilst this whole rescue operation is starting to kick up. And 10 minutes later I try once again and I try as much as I could to move my foot, move my toe, move my legs, and I couldn't. And I think in that moment I realised that I was seriously injured and, you know, thoughts of the future and how this would impact my life started to run through my head. So three hours later, surrounded by the mountain rescue team with a Coast Guard helicopter hovering above the face of World's End, a winchman coming down, and I'm about to be taken away to, to intensive care. And, you know, I made myself a, a commitment and a promise that was not from a position of strength and resilience and courage, but was from a position of vulnerability. And that was that, you know, whatever happens next, just don't let it beat you. And, um, you know, that promise of, of not being beaten, not giving up was really difficult to, to hold myself to account to in the first kind of week because, you know, you go through a, a nine hour surgery to come around the next morning, you know, lying in an intensive care ward with a stranger at the end of your bed in the form of a surgeon that you've never seen before, giving you the news that um, you don't want to hear, which is that, you know, as I landed, I'd broken my back into two pieces. I'd severed my spinal cord 
And that kind of meant that as hard as I could try and hard as I might try, I would never learn to walk again. I would never be able to naturally walk again. And how did you feel towards Matt knowing that he had saved your life? I didn't, I genuinely didn't realise that he'd risked his own life until perhaps a week later. So a week later, another one of our friends called Harry shows me a, a picture on, on social media, which was uh, posted on Twitter the day of my accident. And it was taken from somebody who's at the roadside below looking up at World's End. And you've got the mountain rescue team, like these tiny red dots three quarters of the way up this cliff. And I think it was that image, you know, and I, and I got to a point where I was coming out of intensive care. I was no longer on some heavy drugs that were keeping my mind a bit kind of woozy. And I saw that picture and really for the first time I realised what he did, you know, what he'd done for me. And, and I realised that picture gave me a sense of perspective that I didn't have before. And that flipped my mindset from unlucky to bloody lucky and from kind of why did this happen to me to thank God I'm still here. And also, Jesus, Matt kind of risked a lot here and didn't question the decision, you know. And I think that's, that's unconditional love at, at its strongest, that you don't question your own safety when you're trying to save, save one of your closest friends. And uh, yeah, yeah, I will be eternally grateful and eternally, you know, in his debt for, for saving my life. I was constantly told, you're going to need to create a new sense of identity. And I didn't want to. I was quite happy with who I was. I didn't want to lose the things that were really important to me. And yeah, I think there was a bit of a stubborn, I don't know, stub stubbornness to, to still be the same person, even if the mode of transport or the way of moving was different. By throwing myself into rehab, you know, I was trying to give myself a chance of coming out of hospital one day and living the kind of life that I wanted to live. I didn't want to lose the sense of adventure, the sense of camaraderie that I'd had mountaineering and in the military, and I didn't want to stop. I think I read that at that time you sort of were looking for people that could be role models. The Paralympics were on while I was in hospital, and for two weeks that was watching people that had been through a very similar lived experience that had kind of said, that's happened, but this is what I did next. So these people really showed me what was possible. And I was so lucky that for two weeks I had two weeks worth of content that was inspiring. Um, but it was when I was trying to look for people that had you know, spinal injuries or were in a wheelchair that had done adventurous stuff that I started to come up a little bit dry. You know, I remember being spoken to by one individual who you know, asked me what I did for a job, asked me what I did for hobbies. He even saw that I had bought a guitar and put it next to my bed because I thought, with all the time in the world, I'm going to do my rehab and I'm going to learn to play guitar. I didn't, but he looked at the guitar, looked at me and said, what injury level are you? And I said, oh, I'm a T6. And he said, I'm sorry, son, but you won't be able to do that. There was a mindset of let's rebel against this, can't, sh shouldn't and won't, um, and kind of just see what's possible and, and see where I can push the boundary. And if I then fail and fall, then I know that's where the boundary is. But you, you don't know where until you start to push it. The toughest moment for my rehab was four, four months in. You know, I was in a long-term relationship with somebody that I thought was, was it. You know, I, I thought this is the person I'm gonna spend the rest of my life with. And I guess, you know, when I look back and, you know, the benefit of hindsight, that person had started to not show up and to not turn up for me to support her partner through <clears throat> some really difficult moments. And then there came a day where she just said, look, I, I should have told you this a long time ago. I should have said this earlier in your, in your rehab, but I can't, you know, I, I can't see a future that this is going to work. I can't see how I can be with somebody that can't run to the top of a hill or go climbing or the things that we did as a couple, I guess. And, um, you know, she kind of said, I'm sorry, burst into tears, turned around, walked out through the double doors of the spinal ward. And that was the last time I saw her. And that was a kick in the gut. And that was, I think, the real moment where that rug had been pulled from underneath. So I remember, you know, not going to rehab, not going to physio, not doing all the things I should have been doing. That blue curtain was pulled around my bed on a ward full of 30 people. And I was just trying to shut, I didn't want to be here. I, you know, I, I, if that person couldn't love me for who I was, then whoever would. And that was the mindset 
that I was kind of in. And a week after it happened, Kate, who had been one of my physios through the process, kind of came into that bed space, came around that blue curtain and went, right. You know, and she was there to take charge of the situation. She knew what, everybody knew what was going through. You know, you can't not. And she said, look, I know that just saying to you, come on, be positive right now is gonna have any difference. You know, it's not like a light switch that we can turn on. So what I want you to do is think about where you want to be in four years time. And I want you to be aspirational about where Darren goes next, be ambitious, and then retrace his steps all the way back to right here, right now, because he's gone through the same thing that you have. And, you know, next time I see you, I want you to tell me what the first tiny step was that he took to get from here to there. And I knew what the first step was. So I got my phone out, I called up Matt, and I said, Matt, there's something I need to do, and I want you to do it with me. And please don't question it. And he said, okay, what are we doing? And I was like, there's a kayak and canoe store two hours from here. I wanna go and buy a sea kayak. And he was like, okay. For two hours, they convinced them to let us bring in these two kayaks. And with my family there, with all of my friends there, we kind of set forth on this second step of this kind of rehab journey, uh, which was to get me on the water for the first time. I remember sitting in my kayak, being really um, excited, keen, nervous. And the second that the boat, the kayak, was fully on the water, I was upside down because I realised that when it comes to kayaking, a lot of this stuff is useful. And I'm, I'm needing to learn to do it with just my upper body. And uh, I fell in 23 times that morning, but every time I got a little bit further, sometimes by 30 centimetres, even though it was the middle of a tiny swimming pool, for me it was probably the biggest achievement of my life. And it was that second step forward and the start of a journey that went from a swimming pool to a canal, to a river, to a lake, to a sea. And then month by month, it was an evolution of just like climbing. Just push it a little bit to where you're uncomfortable and where it's a little bit 50-50, reset and then push again. And we just did that as a friendship. And it brought my friends so much closer. You know, me and Matt had always had a very close friendship, but then all of a sudden my wider friendship group were involved in it as well. There were moments where we turned up to kayak on a river and there'd be a locked farmer's gate and the next second they're lifting me up out of my chair and like hurling me across this gate to be caught by two people the other side. And it just added a dimension to, to friendship of teamwork that we hadn't had. And they just empowered me to, to, to think big. So I called up four friends that I've met through one of the military charities that kind of helps to rehab soldiers through snow sport. And I said to them, look, I've got this crazy idea. Do you want to do it with me? And the idea was to kayak from Land's End in Cornwall to John O'Groats in Scotland. It had never been done before. About 1,400 kilometres, you've got the Atlantic Ocean at the start, Bristol Channel, North Sea, Irish Sea, North Sea, sorry. So four really dangerous, wild places. And I'd pitched them the idea with no more detail than the distance, how long it would take us, I thought, and that we could raise money for charity. And the four of them, without really any hesitation, were like, sounds good, let's do it. And what I loved was that when you looked at the five of us, what we didn't have was natural ability or natural talent in sea kayaking. But we were five people that had been through those life-changing injuries. I realised very quickly it was going to be the biggest challenge of my life with my injury to one side. Ignoring that, it was the biggest challenge of my life because, you know, you're trying to do something that probably isn't feasible for somebody with a, a high-level spinal cord injury. So I fell in 10 minutes into the start of day one and Whilst I felt embarrassed and stupid a little bit, it made me realise something that was, we will get to John O'Groats if every 10 minutes, if all I do is fall in, as long as I drag myself back up out of the water, get my ass back in that seat, pick the paddle up out of the water and go again, we will get there. And it was just brilliant, you know, and as this journey continued and we pushed up into the Irish Sea, uh, into the southwest of Scotland, there was one particular day where we're paddling through the locks of southwest Scotland and, you know, it's around the time of my, um, you know, anniversary of my accident, a day that I'd never really known how to feel. Am I, am I upset? Am I bitter? Am I happy? And, you know, we're paddling through and all of a sudden there's a pod of dolphins that are jumping up out of the water in front of us. Beautiful, calm, still Scottish sea, which is a rarity. Mountains to one side, islands to the left, paddling along, working hard, you know, and I realised that in many ways, all of the things that were important to me before my accident were still there. 
you know, I was still doing something adventurous, still doing something that was pushing the limit of, is this possible, is it not possible? And most importantly, I, I had a team, you know, I was part, I had that camaraderie, I had that sense of shared vision and shared purpose that was always so important. I, I kind of felt like I'd lost. And, you know, we arrived at John O'Groats, we rounded the final piece of headland, so the final sea cliffs, and John O'Groats is two kilometers in the distance after 26 days. Arriving at John O'Groats, having that moment of, of success and celebration with the, with the guys around me and with the team that had supported us, um, I looked to the future with renewed optimism and I looked to the future, I don't know, suddenly realizing or appreciating that just because I had a disability and just because I had a spinal cord injury, just because I sit in a wheelchair, it didn't limit what was possible. I don't really talk about it that often, but um, my dad had, had struggled with his mental health for two, three years. And I, uh, yeah, I think mental health is so difficult. I've never struggled with mine in a way. I've been very lucky that I've had the answers from other people or I've found the right kind of lessons that have pulled me through. Dad um, was different. You know, dad uh, was so locked in this battle that logic couldn't really pull him out. And um, a couple of months after we got back from John O'Groats, he took his own life. And yeah, that kind of was an unexpected turn of events that did a couple of things, I guess. It, in one way, pushed me to start sharing my journey with other people. I started to talk and I started to speak about what had happened to me and what were the lessons I'd learned that had really helped in those moments, perspective, what Kate had said, you know, other stuff. Um, in the hope that one day I might talk to someone in a room that was going through what he was going through, but it might be the right message at the right time. I guess it's just a message of hope that even though we do face adversity in our lives and we do have those really difficult dark moments, we're not defined by that one day or we're not defined by that five month period. And it's the hope that you know all of us can take the darkest moment of our life and turn it into the lightest, the brightest, the biggest achievement of your life. And hopefully giving hope to people like my dad. You know, someone who's struggling right now, who doesn't have the answers, but may draw strength from somebody else's battle and fight. So it, it all really does relate back to him in some way as well. We didn't know what the next step would be. We knew we hadn't got an SOS off. We knew that we were 200 miles west of the Galapagos Islands. We had no water and no food, as we thought then.